Hi folks, welcome back. So today we're shifting our lenses towards the biological approach to understanding personality. So far we've covered the psychoanalytic approach, the trait approach, and now we'll be moving to the biological approach. We will be looking at the theory, application, and assessment um, under this approach. So the outline for the presentation is going to be First, we will look at Hans Ising's theory of personality. We'll look over the idea and theory of temperament. We will look at evolutionary personality psychology's ideas towards personality traits and personality development. And then we'll look at the application value of children's temperaments in schools and the research behind that. And we'll look at the assessment values behind using brain electrical activity machines and um, the findings on cerebral asymmetry and how that impacts mood. We'll end the presentation with discussing the strengths and criticisms of this approach as we do all the other approaches and then um, the summary of the presentation. So let's take it away. So Hans Ising is um, was a very strong proponent of the biological approach to personality. He was born in Germany into a family of, you could say, celebrities. Um, his dad was an actor and um, they had high expectations from their son. Um, Hans Ising was known to be born to be the center of attention in whatever field he entered. So it speaks a little bit about his pioneering type of personality and his um, ability to influence um, his ideas and, and research in, into, the, into the psychology world. So he was, the pro he was a proponent of the biological approach to personality. He's known for his structure of personality where he employed factor analysis to identify super traits. Remember how we spoke about factor analysis in our previous presentations? And so um, the work of Donald Fisk, he was the person who sort of proposed the predecessors to the big five factor theory of personality. However, it was Hans Ising who proposed these I, these specific terms that we now see in the big five factor theory of personality. He said that all traits can be subsumed within three basic personality dimensions. So now we have the five factor theory of personality, but we were getting very close. According to Isaac, he said the three basic dimensions include extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, and psychoticism. So psychoticism is something that we don't see in the big five factor theory of personality, but initially these were the three dimensions that he had proposed. So I think divided the elements of personality into units that can be arranged hier hierarchically. Sorry for my pronunciation of this word. Um, so we'll, we'll look at the diagram in terms of what he's talking about because it's easier to explain through visuals but just want you to know that there were these personality traits that could be arranged in hierarchies um, they had constructs and subconstructs and then sub subconstructs and so on um, so he said that there are basic structures that are at the bottom of the hierarchy that that are defined as the specific response levels. For example, an extrovert will behave in more friendly ways when he goes out. So there were these specific behaviors that certain dimensions of personality could be deconstructed into. His initial factor analytic research yielded two basic dimensions, which we spoke about just now, extroversion, introversion, and neuroticism. And he said that pers these personality dimensions were independent of one another. So here we see the hierarchical model of personality that he had proposed. And let's take the example of extroversion. So he said that the super trait, which is like right at the top of the hierarchy, could be divided into traits. So with according to him, he said it could be divided into five traits. So an extroversion person, a person who is extroverted, is sociable, impulsive, 
active, lively, and excitable. And this can further be divided into habitual response levels. And so someone who's sociable can, maybe he loves to make friends. He um, has all of these habits, like they are more confident. They are, let's say, they confidently introduce themselves to others. They are not shy. So these are all like specific habits that sociable people have. Um, they're on the street and they would randomly start talking to people and making friends. So these are these habitual responses that sociable people have. And within this habitual response level, this can further be broken down into specific response levels. So let's say a sociable person um, is can easily walk into a party and make friends. So that's the habit, right? So the person enters a hall full of people and starts introducing themselves. They cannot just be calm and shy and to the side. And so this can specifically broken down into response levels. So if they're at the party, they will they will talk about themselves, they will say they will say compliments to other people so that's one aspect of this that can be broken down and so every habitual response level has further specific response levels so if you see this you can see that extroversion or whatever dimension of personality is here can be broken down into traits broken down into habitual responses and further broken down to specific response levels just as um you can you see high resolution factors at the bottom of the hierarchy and over here it's a low resolution factor right extroversion we get we get it it's like extroversion but then it's when you break it down to its core that it becomes more clear as to exactly what's going on so Hans Eysenck stated that extroverts are outgoing, impulsive, uninhibited, and sociable. Introverts are quiet, introspective, reserved, and distant, except to intimate friends. People high on neuroticism are unstable or highly emotional, easily upset and angered. Individuals low on neuroticism are less prone to emotional swings. So they're more sort of stable versus unstable. And so he came up with these um, dimensions or four quadrants, you could say. In the north and south pole of the quadrant, he placed what is known as unstable, the neurotic types, and then the stable, which are the people who are non-neurotic. Non and they're sort of on the more stable, they don't, they don't carry their emotions on their sleeves or get perturbed easily. These are the type of more stable people. If any of you have watched that show on Discovery Channel called um, Survivor or, um, uh, you know, when they put people in the middle of the forest and they ask them to figure stuff out, these people tend to be very high on stability because if you're not, then they would freak out and they would go all berserk. But because they're able to contain themselves, not get anxious easily, not get perturbed easily, they can problem solve and survive even amongst the wildest of conditions. And so that's just an example of a certain personality type that, that thrives in certain environments more than others. And so as you see, we can find unstable and stable on the north and south side. We, found we find introvert and extrovert on the east and west side of this um, figure. So introverted, extroverted, stable, unstable, and whatever falls within each of these four quadrants is what exemplifies the two together. And so let's say someone who is stable and extroverted, they, they have these leadership qualities, they're carefree, lively, easygoing, responsive, talkative, outgoing, sociable. They, you, could, you could say these are traits that can easily de define someone who is well put together, someone who is stable and also outgoing and well put together is a good word to describe this quadrant right here. Now let's look at stable and introverted. So people who are stable and introverted 
are also similar to this. They, they have those stability factors. They don't get perturbed easily. However, they're not out very much out there. They're more personal. They're more um, inhibited. So they're passive. They're careful. They're thoughtful, peaceful, controlled, reliable, even tempered. They're calmer. So if someone on this quadrant is more outgoing and lively, someone on the other quadrant is calmer, they could come off as less enthusiastic, more peaceful kind of um, kind of trait. So now when we look at the third quadrant, which is, let's see, unstable and introverted, here we start seeing that even though someone is introverted, they are moving more towards the unstable type. So moody, right? Someone who's moody immediately, like you don't know what mood they could be at any time. They're unpredictable. They get anxious quickly. They might be rigid because why do you think people who with unstable personalities are rigid? Because already their personality is unstable. And so if they, they it's, it's like a compensatory mechanism. If they're not if they're flexible, then there's fluidity on both sides, right? They're unstable, so they need to be rigid to compensate for their unstability, to find something that can root them down. Because if if everything was sort of, if they were, if the condition um, made them be flexible, then they're already sort of hanging by the thread. And now, they, they have to be flexible too. There's nothing that grounds them. And so it's kind of a survival mechanism, you could say, being rigid, especially when you have a neurotic trait. Um, they're sober, pessimistic, reserved, unsociable, quiet. Again, unsociable, why do you think people who are introverted and unstable are unsociable? Because they want to control their environment as much as possible because they themselves don't have something that is within their control within themselves and so all of these traits might seem of someone who's being difficult but in other words they're actually being they're compensatory traits things that are making them feel externally more stable because internally they feel very unstable now let's look at this quadrant so unstable and extroverted so people over here are also sort of like not rooted firmly to the ground from within themselves, but they're more towards the exhibiting side. So they, they don't mind showing it. So they're active, they're optimistic, They but this optimism might tend to more towards the impulsiveness, like recklessness, right? So, oh, I want to go drink or have or smoke or, you know, things like that. But they overdo it. They're not sort of un in the stable, towards the stable side. They're towards the unstable side. They can be changeable, excitable, aggressive, restless, touchy. So people in the manic, manic, uh, um, who are... Uh, experiencing manic symptoms in a bipolar state could fall under this. And uh, people who are more towards the depressed side might fall under this. And so this is a very good example of how Heinz Isings conceptualized his two major personality dimensions. <coughs> Excuse me. So now what about the third super trait found by Isink, right? He called it psychotic, psychoticism, and although it didn't catch um, or it didn't retain itself until our generation, it was still something that was important to Isink, and he described people who are high on this um, as egocentric, aggressive, and impersonal. So these were sort of his... Um, formulations of the psychotic type of personality dimensions. So Isaac's arguments were simple. They were threefold. He said that whatever dimension he proposed, which was extroversion, introversion, neuroticism and stuff, these were consistent over time. So you could find, you could do studies across cultures, you could do studies within same samples, within different samples and all of that jazz, and still you would find consistency across these traits. 
Cross-cultural researchers indicate the three dimensions of personality was a second argument. So he said there's consistency, there's cross-cultural consistency. And the third and the most important was that he said genetics played a vital role in determining a person's placement on the personality dimensions. And this is where we come more in tune with the biological basis of personality, where we start talking about the biological aspects of what determines a person's placement on the personality dimensions. So it could be certain genes that are elevated, certain um, chemicals in the brain, certain expressions, repressions, um, epigenetic mechanisms. So all of these biological mechanisms that lead people to behave in certain ways that stay consistent over time, that together form the dimension of personality, that shape their personality. And so he called it um, <clears throat> stimulation sensitivity, behavioral activation inhibition systems. So he said that one of the ways that we can understand the way introverts and extroverts function is their sensitivity to stimulation. So introverts and extroverts differ in how they, their brains respond to emotional stimuli. Introverts are quickly aroused when exposed to external stimulation. That's why they prefer um, their, sort of their set point or their baseline is pretty low when it comes to external stimulation. And so introverts tend to stay at home because they feel enough stimulated at home itself, let alone going outside. Whereas extroverts need the stimulation, their baseline is higher to, for, for receiving stimulation. And so when they go out to, let's say, parties or they go out, they meet people, they, they hang out with, with crowds, that's what stimulates them. That's when their stimulation starts happening. And what does stimulation mean? It basically means like what um, helps you feel aligned to your own level of energy, right? So they feel energized. They feel aligned. They feel... Um, like they are um, in the right place and and it brings them to life you know all of these feelings are felt when extroverts are out there meeting people or hanging out in big crowds whereas if they stay at home it would be so under stimulating for them it would almost be depressing or it would almost be um, like feel very lonely and very scary However, people who are on the introverted end, they will happily stay at home. But if they, if they go out, they might be so overstimulated that they might feel overwhelmed and just not like it that much. And so it's very important to see that one of Ising's propositions were the sensitivity to stimulation. And um, he said that introverts are less sensitive are more sensitive to stimulation, sorry, are more highly sensitive to stimulation. That's why even a little bit of it does the job for them, whereas extroverts are not. And he also spoke about the behavior approach system and the behavior inhibition system. Let's call this the BAS and the BIS. So this is the reinforcement sensitivity theory. And what was proposed is that the human brain has a BAS and a BIS. Individuals also differ in the strength of the bass and bis, and differences are stable over time. So people who are extroverts probably have a more active bass system, right? Approach system. People who are introvert have a more bis system. They're more inhibited system. So the findings said that people with a high bass seek out and achieve pleasurable goals. Individuals low on bass get pleasure out of rewards and anticipating those rewards, right? So they don't necessarily, um, so they, 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 they love to go out, seek pleasurable activities, get rewarded, even anticipation of those rewards, like, um, you know, experimenting, being open, trying out new things, gets them going. Whereas people with the high bis are apprehensive and quick to retreat from problematic situations. They experience more anxiety. So people who are high on the bis, which is the inhibitory system, they, they tend to, you know, steer clear of too much approach um, 
behaviors. They like to be on their own, do their own thing. They feel anxious, apprehensive. So people with the high BIS um, experience, since they experience more anxiety, they, they just prefer to retreat and stay out of those overly stimulating situations. And so two ways of describing extrovert introvert behaviors one is through that sensitivity to stimulation and the second is through the bis and bas um, in systems now this brings us to temperament remember i think said that there's a genetic component to uh, these personality dimensions so let's go to the idea of temperament what is temperament People say that temperament is something that we are naturally born with. It's like a genetic predisposition. It stays stable over time. And it can be also uh, categorized into different classifications, right? A person who has a difficult temperament, a person who is easygoing, a person who is very sensitive. And you find this in kids. It's, it's almost like they're born with that temperament. So let's say you have a kid and the kid is very stubborn. Now the kid may not have necessarily learned this from the environment and maybe there is a natural, um, not maybe, but most likely there is a natural side to their stubbornness, the genes that they're born with, but environment also plays a role. So if parents reinforce the stubbornness or let's say the parents appreciate the child for being stubborn or say, oh, my child is so stubborn, he's the boss, he never, he would never listen, he makes his own decisions. So that is kind of reinforcing, right? The, the kid to continue being that way. And so the environment also plays an important role in the maintenance of certain temperaments. And so uh, temperament, a general behavioral disposition that can be expressed in different ways depending on an individual's experiences. Development into stable personality traits depends on complex interplay of genetic predispositions and the environment. So there are three dimensions in temperament. The first type of temperament, you could say um, it is, um, emotionality, right? So emotionality is the intensity of emotional reactions like we had studied in the earlier presentation. So people who are highly emotional or born with an emotional temperament, they, they express, children high on emotionality frequently express anger. As adults, they're easily upset and have quick temper. So people, it's almost like walking on eggshells with these people. They quickly get agitated. They quickly uh, jump into the, um, the anger mode or the temper mode. And so emotionality is a big um, dimension um, of one of the temperaments out of the three that we will look at today. And as you, as you acquaint yourself with these dimensions, you might even familiarize or recall some of the people you've met in your own life, including yourself, as to which dimension you yourselves fall into. And this is something I encourage you to do to gain deeper insights into your own um, patterns, own behaviors, and own personality understanding. So the second temperament um, was proposed to be the level of activity, how active you are, the level of energy. So activity is the person's general level of energy. Highly active children move around a lot and prefer games that require running and jumping. As grown-ups, they're always on the go and prefer high-energy activities. And the last type of temperament that was proposed is sociability. So sociability is a general tendency to affiliate and interact with others. So children who are sociable seek out other children to play. As adults, they have lots of friends, enjoy social gatherings, and so... These three temperaments are, in, you can summarize them as the three important dimensions of personality in terms of understanding personality through dispositions or temperaments. Emotional child, active child, and sociable child. And research has found that this pretty much stays consistent over the long term. Even as adults, this is something that stays put. Now, when we look at gender differences in temperament, we also see significant variation. 
Girls exhibit a higher level of effortful control than boys. Boys are identified with an increased level of surgency than girls. So they can be more quick, they could be more clever. Uh, do things that require these type of um, characteristics. So gender differences is also a very real thing when it comes to temperament. Adult personalities are determined by both inherited temperament and the environment. So as I just reiterated a couple minutes ago, it's not all about the temperament. It's like, that's it. You're born with this. You're stuck with this. That's a done deal. Go home, right? That's not the case. Temperament influences the environment, which in turn influences the way temperament develops into stable personality traits. So let's say a very stubborn child is born in an environment where their parents do not give any type of value or encouragement to such behavior. So if they say, if the child is being super stubborn, throwing tantrums, the parents do not reinforce this behavior, the parents stay strong they do not give in to the child's requests and demands and so the child learns that you know they cannot live being stubborn in this manner so even though they have this natural stubbornness they will um they will channel it in positive ways they they might negotiate in more adaptable more healthy ways with the parents they might not give up but they might learn how to negotiate in proper ways and so um, it is very important to know that it's not that simple. There's always an interplay between bio biology, between nature and nurture. Now, when we look at inhibited and unhib uninhibited children, we see that, again, this is a categorization, and we can see that children can also be divided into these two categories, inhibited, uninhibited, you could say extroverted, introverted, right? Just another way of saying it. Um, but inhibited children are the ones that are controlled and the gentle ones. And the way it works is that growing up, they're more attached to their parents. They are slower to explore new environments. They're anxious um, about novel situations. Uninhibited children are the ones that are excited, they're rough and tough, they're quick to explore new environments, and so on and so forth. So when you look at these dimensions, you'll see that um, inhibited children, um, they might be brought up in a way where the parents discourage them from going out and venturing into the world. Whereas uninhibited children, maybe their parenting was sort of like, go out, go do your thing. Like, you know, there's less control over the child. And so the child learns to become more independent, more rough and tough. But again, there's a balance here. You don't want too much independence because that will, that might just lead to like conduct issues or, you know, like recklessness or re rebel kind of behaviors and so there's always this balance that's needed too much inhibition on the other side can lead to socially anxious personality types so inhibited and uninhibited unhi styles represent inherited biological temperaments inhibited children run the risk of developing social anxiety disorder uninhibited children are likely to exhibit disruptive behavior disorders they did a study in which they look at the correlation between inhibition measures at 21 months and behaviors at five and a half years old, just to see for how long do these um, behaviors or these temperaments or dispositions that you were born with, to for how long do they stay put or they last? And they actually found that there were pretty high correlations. Um, if, if you're born with, um, let's say, um, let's say which is the highest one here, playing with unfamiliar children, right? So the correlation between your ability to play with unfamiliar children at age 21 months, as well as the age five and a half years was very high. And you could see the same across the different um, behaviors, right? Ball toss riskiness. So if you, if you felt that you 
the ball tossing was a risky behavior at 21 months. You also felt similarly at age five and a half years. So some children appear to inherit a tendency to respond to unfamiliar situations with increased arousal. When entering a new situation with new people, many of these children display what we typically call shy behavior. So as we spoke in the previous presentation, socially anxious people, people who are typically shy are the ones that can easily be aroused. Um, they, they get overstimulated quickly. Their baseline is pretty low on um, stimulation. And so they tend to be more towards the shy side. So this is an example here. This picture shows you how a shy child might be uh, seeking shelter behind his father's leg because he feels too overwhelmed by um, in the, the interpersonal interaction um, that comes with him meeting someone new. And so this child is, you can see he's having a hard time coping with his own um, sort of social anxiety and he is taking his father's security as um, support. Um, now, when we look at the evolutionary personality psychology, we also see some propositions towards understanding why people are the way they are, why personalities develop the way they develop. According to evolutionary principles, inherited tendencies to become nervous and upset in certain situations actually allows our species to survive. So when we go back to this picture, the fact that this child is behaving in a shy manner is actually evolutionarily adaptive for his survival as a species, and it will ensure that he grows up to reproduce and pass down offspring and progeny and so on and so forth. So the reason why he's shy is so he can escape any impending danger. And so according to the evolutionary personality psychology perspective, we see that being shy, being nervous, being afraid are things that are protecting you from putting yourself in potential dangerous situations. Again, a balance is needed. Too much of it means that you're not even exploring the unknown territory which stunts your growth. And so a balance is always needed. Natural selection and psychological mechanisms. Inherited characteristics of a species help them meet, survive, and reproduce, responsible for psychological mechanisms. Now again, anxiety, we know that it's an unpleasant emotional state. A normally functioning person would avoid uh, the primary cause that people feel anxious is they're afraid of, you know, apprehensive evaluation, social exclusion. And why do you think they're afraid of social exclusion? Because if you are part of a social group, there's a higher chance of you reproducing and surviving and adapting and being able to be protected by your group. So, but again, it could also be dangerous to venture out into the social group because the social group itself may be dangerous for your survival. It can outcompete you and so on and so forth. So primitive people avoided behaviors that led to social exclusion in order to survive and reproduce. So it could go both ways, right? So the reason why anxiety has worked itself into our personalities even in today's world. The reason why fears have worked themselves into today's world is because primitively people, like p people from the caveman days and so on, they, they used these behaviors as adaptive behaviors to avoid fearful situations. And this ensured to a certain extent their survival and their ability to reproduce. And so it's something that was adaptive in the long run and so it stayed put. Now, we're shifting gears towards the application value of learning about children's temperaments as well as how this applies in school settings. So, so far we've talked about the research, the concepts, the ideas and theories, and now let's really see how to apply these in real life settings. So, 
research has found that children can again be divided into easy child, difficult child, and the slow to warm up child category. And this helps a lot in school settings because it kind of tells um, the teacher what is the best way to educate these children. So an easy child is someone who eagerly approaches new situations, is adaptive, experiences a positive mood, they have a healthy level of confidence. A difficult child is tough to adapt to new environments and are often in a negative mood. They do not feel secure enough to go out and venture or approach new novel situations. The slow to warm up child is someone who is initially withdrawn, um, but then they start familiarizing themselves with the space and then they get comfortable. And so academic performance, when you look at temperament and academic performance, studies have indicated that temperament is not really related to intelligence. Intelligence is more so a uh, genetic predisposition. However, um, Studies have found that children with difficult or slow to warm up patterns perform poorly versus children with easy temperaments who get higher grades. Now, the reason being, you can think about it, it makes a lot of sense because children who are easy, who are confident, who are out there, they might be good at quickly grasping concepts quickly making friends, quickly um, opening themselves up to learning, to, to situating themselves in the environment. However, uh, children who are difficult, who are slow to warm up, they're so close that they don't even, they're not even receptive to, to learning or to, uh, let's say, they're not receptive to uh, getting to know others. And so all of these inhibitory, um, inhibitory, um, behaviors causes these kids to not be able to perform as well. So certain temperaments are compatible with the requirements of the classroom. Teachers misinterpret temperamental differences in students. And if the teachers have a better ability to understand children's temperament, then you can actually match temperament with teaching. And this is known as the goodness of fit model. So creating an environment and procedures that are conducive to learning based on the temperament of the student. Teachers who match teaching style with temperament, okay? So teachers who are able to match their teaching styles. So increase child's chances of academic success, contribute to the child's feelings of self-worth. So let's say there is a really difficult child in the classroom. They are absolutely inhibited, completely unattentive or unreceptive to listening or learning. What is the best way, what is the best teaching style or environment for this child? Well, maybe decrease the amount of stimulation around the child. Maybe put the child in a classroom with fewer kids. And... Do not put the kid on the spot. So do not tell the kid to respond to your questions in front of the other children, but maybe have a one-on-one -on -one session with the kid and consistently positively reinforce the child for any slight receptivity from his end. What this does to the child is that this slowly makes the child feel comfortable in the setting first and foremost. And once the child feels comfortable, they start feeling more receptive to the to the teachings, to the learnings, to the and, and they're more open to learning the concepts and ideas, which in turn increases their chances of academic success. And this in turn feeds the well self worth of the child. The child starts feeling that they're competent, they, they can learn things versus them feeling like they don't know how to be better at certain things if they weren't given the right environment. And so um, the application value behind understanding children's temperaments and uh, matching temperament to teaching is very, very important research finding that led to these um, policies that help children be put in environments that are most conducive, most appropriate for their best performance. Now let's shift gears again and go to the assessment side of things. So biological approach uh, 
scientists and pioneers under this approach were also interested in assessing how certain brain activities or certain, let's say, biological um, underpinnings related to personalities, behaviors, and so on. So what they did was they took what is known as the electroencephalograph, which is the EEG in short, and it is known to measure brain activity, the, electron, the electrical activity of the brain. And they, they hooked the person onto these different uh, EEG wires, you could say, um, and they measured the electrical activity in different parts of the human brain. Um, now, EEG is easy, it does not harm the individual, it records brain activity in quick intervals, and then it also gives you the alpha wave, which is useful for research on personality and emotion. So this is an example. Researchers measuring brain activity levels with an instrument known as EEG. The information would tell us about the person's tendencies to experience different emotions. You, you see here on the right side, there are the different ac uh, electrical activities depicted in visual um, graphical forms. Um, you will see that they can be divided into five different, uh, let's say, let's say, um, what are these called? Like wave patterns. So you have different wave patterns based on different electrical activities that go on in the brain. So alpha is kind of the, the rest, reflective restful state. So when a, when a person is, let's say, meditating or they're, they're just relaxed, this is the alpha waves that, um, put, that depict themselves as part of the EEG. Um, measure. The beta wave is something that when you're busy or active. So for example, now that I'm presenting this to you, I'm actively thinking, I'm busy with my words, thoughts, I'm focused. If I was hooked onto an EEG right now, you would probably see the beta waves. Now the gamma waves are the ones that are very high energy, high flow states. These are waves where you're like flying, you're, you're cruising, and you're, you're, you're just like on high energy level like you're problem solving you're focused like nothing is getting in the way like you're you're you feel like you're flowing right when you're in this state most let's say an example would be let's say a writer is on the pinnacle of their their writing and they are just flowing with ideas they're focused they're they're not at all distracted all these ideas are coming through in very smooth and soft and natural ways and this is if they were hooked down to the EEG this is the pattern you would see now on the other end theta waves is things where you get drowsy and sleepy if you connected someone who is drowsy and sleepy onto an EEG this is what you would find like even the waves seem like they're drowsy and sleepy they're not as active like you see here and then the delta are this the, the most deepest sleep when you're dreaming it's almost like the wave is like ooh, it's like so so gentle so um so low frequency. So these are just some examples of how the EEG can show us uh, the different activities that go on in the brain. So what they did was they took the EEG and they measured something known as cerebral asymmetry. So cerebral asymmetry is the difference in the activity level between the anterior region of a person's right and left cerebral hemisphere. So asymmetry is basically meaning that there are different activity levels on the right and left hemispheres of your cerebral cortex on the anterior region, so the, the front side of your cerebral cortex. So researchers found that higher activation in the left hemisphere of your brain was associated with positive moods, while higher activation in the right hemisphere was indicative of negative moods. That's so interesting, right? So if you took a person in a very positive mood, you would see that when they were hooked to the EEG, their left hemisphere is the one that is more active than their right hemisphere. There were also individual differences found in cerebral symmetry. Hemisphere which displayed the high activity level differed among people, okay? 
So differences in cerebral asymmetry tend to be stable over time. And now it's not just the fact that they're in a positive mood or a negative mood, but even in sort of a consistent manner, these activity levels differed amongst people. Okay, now you're seeing that consistent personality kind of dimension coming through, through understanding um, the electrical activities of the brain. What they found was that the left hemisphere activity is related to movement towards the source of the emotion. And the right hemisphere activity is related to movement away from the source of emotion. So anxiety sufferers have higher right side activation than non-anxious individuals. So let's say a person is highly neurotic, right? If you put a highly neurotic person on an EEG machine, you would see that their right hemisphere is tends to be usually more activated than the left hemisphere, um, which is sort of a consistent pattern that you see in people with highly neurotic personality types. Um, and so measures of a cerebral asymmetry were useful in predicting bipolar disorder, you know, things where you find people on manic or depressive ends. So it's almost like on the manic side, their left hemisphere is very activated. On the depressed side, their right hemisphere is very activated. So it was a very interesting observation made to predict bipolar disorder, right? So if you see someone in with this pattern, you will you will be able to predict that, oh, they might have a predisposition to bipolar, which is like high highs, low lows kind of um, an experience. So this brings us towards the end of today's presentation. We will now look at the strengths of the biological approach followed by the criticisms. So some of the strengths of the biological approach to understanding personality is that it provides a bridge between the study of personality and the discipline of biology. It's very obvious that it does. It, it puts our own um, body into perspective, right? How our body relates to our emotions, our mental health, our, our personality. That's sort of more on the abstract level. Bringing that abstraction into a concrete reality. Um, it identifies realistic parameters for psychologists interested in behavioral change, right? So more concrete, realistic parameters can be measured based on what is found within the body, the changes, the variations, across people, across genders, across cultures. Researchers have generated empirical support for hypotheses advanced from this perspective. So again, there's research out there that actually provides solid support for this perspective. However, some of the limitations are that biologists face limits on their ability to test their ideas, right? So you could say that, okay, and for example, you could say anxiety was something that uh, was passed down across generations because it helped people survive and not get killed, right? If that's a proposition that you're making, well, it's a very difficult idea to test because how are you going to test that? Are you going to measure everyone's anxiety level over years and years and years while controlling everyone else's lack of anxiety and then you will see how it manifests in the world? Well, it's not a very clear-cut uh, design and there are a lot of covariates, there are a lot of confounding variables that might interfere in measuring this hypothesis. So biologists face limits on their ability to test certain ideas especially evolutionary ones. Assumption that every human characteristic serves a survival function. Now that's an assumption. You can say it does serve a survival function, but at the end of the day, it's an assumption. It's hard to test it. There is a lack of an agreed upon model on temperament, right? So in other, um, like if you look at the trait approach to personality, people have come up with the gold standard method of understanding personality, which is the big five factor theory of personality. Extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, openness, um, um, agreeableness, and um, conscientiousness, right? So those are all the, the types that have there's this agreed upon model. But in temperament, there's no agreed upon model as of yet. It's lacking. 
Um, you could say temperament is like biological, but it's also nurture. It's a constant interplay between the two. Maybe that itself could be a model, but it's something that must be more agreed upon. No schools, the last criticism is that there are no schools of psychotherapy based on the biological approach. So if you look at the psychoanalytic school of thought, you have so many schools. You have the object relations, you have the interpersonalists, you have the neo-Freudians, the Freudians, you have the existentialists, the, the humanists, when you look at the humanistic approach. So all of these ended up forming psychotherapies, right? So let's say the psychoanalytic school of thought, the object relations, their, th their therapy, their psychotherapy was related to looking at the dynamics the person shares with their objects in the world and, and seeing how these were formed and what how they manifest in today's world and where things went wrong and helping the them de deconstruct it and then reintegrate that into a wholesome individuated being but um when it comes to the biological approach there isn't a specific psychotherapy that came out of it like you can't just say okay we know that there is this you know um bilateral asymmetry between people so the psychotherapy that we are designing is to help people create a bilateral symmetry or you know to to moderate this biological asymmetry right so there's no such school of psychotherapy that comes off of the biological approach and maybe people are coming up with methods but there's nothing as of yet it is more in the assessment stages of things so with this, we conclude our, our presentation for today. Um, this is the summary of everything we spoke about. Feel free to look at it and all the best.